What's left of Hurricane Harvey is now hundreds of miles away, but the damage in Texas is still piling up. Officials say more than 150,000 homes around Houston were flooded, and some 20,000 could stay that way for days to come. Still, the beginnings of recovery are underway. In parts of southeast Texas, cleanup is now in high gear. People are dumping everything from furniture to carpeting to clothes, and garbage bags line the streets. Search teams have been going block by block, checking thousands of homes, and they hope to be finished by tomorrow. But even as the flooding recedes in parts of the city, Mayor Sylvester Turner says it's not over for others, especially in the western districts. That's where reservoirs are still releasing water. If you have water in your home today, the odds are you're going to continue to have water in your home over the next 10 to 15 days. And with that being the case, and the stress and the strain that's been posed on first responders, as well as your own public safety, uh, I am asking you, I'm asking you uh, to leave your homes. Out on the Texas coast, the city of Port Arthur also faces more days underwater. Some say it's still hard to believe. We underestimated. We didn't thought it was going to be this devastating. I mean, uh, I never thought my area would actually be really flooded, like flooded to a point where you actually had to swim out. The U.S. Coast Guard reports it rescued another 3,000 people across southeast Texas in the last 48 hours. In the city of Beaumont, with 120,000 people, officials managed today to set up a distribution point for bottled water. That's after its water pumping station was drowned by a swollen river. We have things that have been neglected, like our flood wall, our pumps. Uh, we have no uh, spirit of proactivity. There were also more reports of gasoline shortages. I'm surprised this is working, which, as you can see, is barely dribbling out. But I'm, it's, there's been no gas since the start of the storm. Very difficult, but again, a little concern compared to what most people are going through, frankly. In Galena Park, Texas, east of Houston, tankers lined up at a fueling depot, hoping to get supplies to gas stations around the state. Texas Governor Greg Abbott spoke in Austin this afternoon. The bottom line is that the state of Texas will have plenty of gasoline showing up at gasoline stations across the state of Texas. So don't worry, we will not run out, and we will be uh, back into our normal pattern before you know it. On top of all that, health experts warn that sewage and floodwaters could make people sick and that mosquito populations will spike in coming weeks. In Washington, President Trump received an update on Harvey recovery efforts from disaster relief organizations. The federal government is on the ground bringing in significant resources to bear. And I want to assure these organizations and the others involved that we will continue to coordinate with them and bring all of the relief and the comfort and everything else that we absolutely can to the Gulf Coast. And the president is set to visit Texas again tomorrow. He'll also go to Louisiana to survey storm damage. Meanwhile, what's left of Harvey continues to wreak havoc in other states. Flooded waterways have driven people from their homes in Tennessee and Kentucky. And tornadoes have spun through Mississippi and Alabama. The storm, now a post-tropical cyclone, is bringing rain bands toward the Ohio Valley. Earlier this week, Officer Haley Morrow of the Beaumont Police Department told us a harrowing story of what her community was facing, including how a mother gave her life to save her toddler daughter. It's hard to imagine, but since we spoke, the situation in Beaumont has only gotten worse. Our William Brangham was out with the National Guard and tells us about what he saw. William, thank you for being with us. Uh, behind you, I see some of the National Guard uh, troops that you were with earlier. Tell us about the mission, what you saw. Well, we came out today with a, with a group who are principally doing water rescue, and they brought in these uh, Mark II boats that are meant to normally build floating bridges, but they've been deploying them all in this area, trying to rescue people out of their homes. We went out on the boat, and what they were trying to do was to rescue one of their colleagues who had been on a prior rescue mission that boat then got pushed by the current. I don't know if you can see in the background here, but there is a torrent of, of flood water receding south, trying to get back out to the Gulf. And one of those boats got trapped in a forest. And so we went out to try to get them out. 
we went through and, and, and basically we are riding one of these boats where boats are not meant to be. It's a forest. We are just on the side of the highway. And just to the left of us, you could see all the time highway signs. You could even make out the highway markings. But the current of this is so strong that we eventually were able to get this boat out by just ramming it. It was almost like bumper cars. These are very sturdy boats. They bumped this other vehicle out. It got freed. And then as we tried to get out, we ourselves got trapped and another vehicle had to come and try to get us out. It was a bit of a chaotic scene. But it, I think it, it, what it gives you is just a bit of a sense of how chaotic and unpredictable and difficult rescue recovery can be. Ultimately, William, how did your boat get free? Well, we're stuck in the forest, and then another boat comes up alongside us, and after banging basically a back and forth against trees and branches, we were able, it took about 20, 25 minutes to get ourselves slowly extricated out. I mean, you have to imagine putting a boat in the middle of a forest with thousands of gallons of fast rushing flood water pressing you against the trees, and you're trying to navigate in a place that is not a navigable waterway. I mean, it was just very, very difficult. Every time we would bang into a tree, a, a sort of a rain of ants would fall down into the boat and people are getting bitten. I mean, it was a fairly hairy, hairy scene, but eventually another boat was able to tie on to us and slowly bang in, drag us out, uh, and we got out. Yeah, multiply that over many hundreds of square miles covered by water, and you get an idea of the challenge that is faced by all these first responders, and in this case, uh, National Guard troops. Who were you with? Tell us about the crew. Exactly. Well, the National Guard are what we know uh, colloquially as weekend warriors. I mean, the guys in our boat were a kid in college, a guy who manages a restaurant, a guy who works in an oil rig, actually a journalist at a local news station was also one of the guardsmen. And these guys, when they get the order from the governor, they just drop everything that they're doing, give up their lives, and come out to serve and try to help their fellow Texans. As one of them said to me today, this is Texans helping Texans. And I said, you know, is it difficult just letting, letting go of your lives? Like some of these guys have damage to their own homes and yet they are here miles away trying to help other people. And I said, Does, you know, do you wish you were back home? And he said, no, my wife knows that if I were back home, I mentally would still be out on the rescue mission. So it's better that I'm out here trying to help my colleagues. It, th that attitude impresses me so much. Do you get the sense though that they're getting weary as time goes on here? Um, not yet. I think that the, the rescue effort is still in its early days. I mean, they have not been getting out into these areas for really about a day, a day and a half. So I think until they really feel that they've exhausted all the things that they do, because in the end, what they're really trying to do is to get to places where people might still be trapped that we just don't know about. People who have lost power, people who have no phones. And that is what's really driving this whole sense of mission out here. As you stand there on Interstate 10, I'm reminded of the challenges of just getting around an area that is affected by uh, the flooding after a hurricane. Give us a sense of what you experienced just today doing what you needed to do to get to this particular assignment. Well, we left Houston this morning, and Houston has largely drained. I mean, there are still some spots that are wet, but the bulk of downtown Houston is dry and the city is starting to come back. As you come further east here towards the border of Louisiana, you really start to see where the flood has not receded yet. We drove through water constantly. There were roads we were rerouted three or four different times. You'd see houses out in the middle of a field completely surrounded by water, like a small island sitting out there. We saw longhorn steer drowned on the side of the road. I mean, it, it just a very surreal experience. We saw an armadillo racing away from flood water, stray dogs walking around. So just a very eerie scene out here as, as this area being a, a day or two from where Houston is a few days ago. William Brangham is in Beaumont, Texas. Thank you. You're welcome, Miles. We move now from Beaumont to the neighboring city of Port Arthur, where the conditions remain dire and dangerous. I spoke by phone with the city's police chief, Patrick Melvin, a short time ago. Chief Melvin, thank you for being with us. I know you're extremely busy. First of all, just paint the picture of where you are and what you're doing right now. Uh, actually, right now, Mr. Bryan, I am in one of the neighborhoods that is still immersed in water. I'm in, in about three to five feet of water right now. Uh, there's still recovery operations, uh, uh, rescue operations going on in this particular neighborhood. So I'm going around to the different command centers that we have uh, within the city of Port Arthur uh, and checking welfare on all the command posts. So give us the big picture. How many rescues so far, and do you have any idea who else is potentially in need of help right now? 
Um, we've had several hundred rescues. We've had uh, a lot of volunteers. We've had the military, the National Guard, and different volunteer organizations that are helping with the boat rescues, the water rescues. We've also had the Coast Guard and the National Guard, uh, specifically Coast Guard, helping with house-type uh, rescues when the, in the totally immersed neighborhoods. So most of those are being done or are, are, are pretty much complete right now. We're going back now just a second uh, just to make you know sure that uh, we have not missed anyone. Some of our community members are hunkering down. Uh, they uh, don't feel they need to leave at this time from the different neighborhoods. But this particular neighborhood is uh, totally immersed in water, and uh, we just want to make sure that uh, we're leaving no one behind at this time. Chief, I imagine that's a particular challenge for you when you run into somebody who just wants to hunker down and stay put. What do you tell them? We express the, uh, the, the, the danger or the possible danger, um, and we uh, make sure they have a uh, telephone in case something does change, they can give us a call. This is uh, not the first time uh, they've been involved in some kind of uh, catastrophe like this, but never have we been involved, from what I understand, in uh, this kind of flooding here in Southeast Texas. What can you tell us about casualties? We've had some air evacuations to different medical facilities due to the extent of some of the medical challenges that we've had. As far as fatalities, the number is relatively low at this time from what I've been briefed up. I know of one particular where we had a gentleman who actually had had a heart attack. However, this situation is nowhere close to being over. Tell us a little bit about shelters. How many people uh, are in shelters there? Yeah, we have uh, we have evacuated most of the shelters. We have one shelter that's um, that's going on right now. Most people have been uh, evacuated out of the area, and there's still about uh, 500 to 800 people uh, in the shelters. I will let you know. Also, uh, there was a lot of uh, social media news about our levee being broken. That is not true. The levee is in great condition. Our community is not releasing water, but there, I've told that there's other communities. Um, around us. However, we will not be affected by those releases. A final point, as I understand it, you are probably the only place in the region that had a bowling alley as a shelter. Tell us a little bit about that. We actually took emergency actions. We made entry into this building and uh, took it over so that we could provide uh, shelter for our residents. You commandeered a bowling alley, but it was all for a good cause, huh? Yes, absolutely. And we're really appreciative of the owners and management of that facility because if it weren't for them and their facility, we would have had a lot of displaced uh, residents out there. Patrick Melvin is the chief of police in Port Arthur, Texas. We wish you well. I know you're still in the middle of it. Thank you very much, sir. We appreciate it. Keep us in your prayers.